more to you this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. How we feeling? Good? Doing all right? Uh, let's see here. I need a little stool. Stool for my water. There we go. So we're continuing through First Peter. First Peter is, uh, is a great book of the Bible. It gives us a picture of a real dude, right? A real guy that uh, uh, maybe our society would uh, describe as a real man's man. Uh, tough guy. Uh, at times would fly off the handle, make some mistakes. Uh, but he was real, and, uh, and, and you, you always knew where he stood on stuff, right? You didn't have to read between the lines with Peter, right? Because it was, if he thought it, he said it or did it, right? And then at least you could confront uh, that thing if he was in the wrong, right? Uh, so I'm hoping that you've been encouraged just by going through uh, the book of First Peter. Uh, we're we're going to keep going and hit Second Peter as well uh, at some point. And uh, this morning we're talking about 1 Peter 3, 13 through 22. And the title of the sermon is Always Ready. Uh, how do you know when somebody's always ready? Are there signs? Are there, is there some kind of indication that somebody is ready? What do you guys think? Give me, some, give me some thoughts here. What do you got? This section. What do you think? How do you know when somebody's ready? Alert. All right, I like that. This section, how do you know when somebody's ready? I know it depends on the circumstance, I get it, but you also have a picture in your head. So what, what's your idea of ready? Okay, enthusiastic, you're leaned into whatever that thing is. What about here? On time, I like that. I like that, you're ready, right? You've anticipated it. I love that. Those are three totally different. What else you got? Okay, <laughs> good. We're keeping it real simple here. They have clothes on. Yes, good. Okay, they're not naked because that would be not ready. Good. Yes, they prepared. Absolutely. All these are great, right? It's important. What, what else you got? They're energized for that which they are preparing for, right? I, I think of a, and, and for the sake of this sermon, I think of uh, an offensive lineman uh, for in football, right? Because uh, you know when they're ready, right? So the offensive lineman is, is in front of the quarterback, and they protect the quarterback from these other meatheads that are trying to get to the quarterback and destroy him and are getting paid $50 million to do it, okay? So the offensive lineman, they stand in front of the quarterback, and you know when they're ready because they put, you know, hands on the ground, and they're in a posture, and there's absolutely no way that dude is running through them. That's their posture, and so they're down, and they're actually leaned in. Now, what if a, an offensive lineman standing there like this? <laughs> right? Flat-footed, he's going to get annihilated, right? right? Not ready, okay? Ready, right? And so, and, and you, can, you can push all you want on those shoulders. Those shoulders are ready for you, right? And those shoulders are also getting paid 25-ish million, blah, 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 but... <laughs> Uh, but they're ready. What does it mean for a believer, for you and I, to be in that same posture, leaned in, expecting attack, not been out of shape over the attack, not been out of shape over that circumstance that we're in, literally postured for that which comes our way. Um, we're talking about suffering, and that's always our favorite subject, so I'm so happy to talk about it. Uh, but suffering ends up being a doorway into other things. God does great things in our lives through suffering, even though we don't want it. Um, God, God doesn't tell us we have to love it, but God does tell us that all kinds of really good things are going to come of it, and, and that's, that's totally different, right? So, um, so always ready. So I'd encourage you to get, get your pens, pens out and, uh, and go through. I have four fill-ins. But I may also have some in-between thoughts uh, because Matt is the type of pastor that can on Wednesday knock the whole thing out and I have all his points. 
I can't do that. I was like thinking really profound thoughts this morning at like seven, right? Uh, last minute. So anyway, um, so I'm going to have you maybe fill in in between the fill-ins as well. Uh, I'm going to have my friend um, Jeff Krill come up and read this passage uh, for us, and I'm going to pray as he comes up. I'm going to pray. God, thank you for your, your word. Thank you for this opportunity this morning uh, that we can, uh, Lord, come to your word with our hearts, uh, but also lay ourselves before you, God, asking you to change us, asking you to uh, do something in us. God, would you give us perspective on whatever comes to mind? Each one of us has something in our life right now that, that is hard. And it could be small hard or it could be really, really big hard. Uh, but God, we know you're there in the midst of it and we know you have suffered infinitely uh, harder things than us. And so God, give us perspective on that thing. And Lord, we love you. Change us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, here we go. The yeah, the meat heads. Oh, stop it. Stop it. Strike that from the record. Clip that out. Thank you. I asked you to read scripture, Jeff. Come on. also suffered once for sins, uh, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. And he put to death in the flesh what could be made alive in the spirit, in which he is the same in the spirit in prison, because they formerly did not obey. And God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which is the first sign of people, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from your body, but as an appeal to God for good conscience. I'm not sure what you read there, <laughs> your resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authority, and powers having been subjected to him. Amen. Thank you. So we're going to let scripture speak for itself this morning. Um, I'm, I'm going to go verse by verse and... Uh, and just unpack what, uh, you know, what Scripture says to us, and read a little, a little into it with uh, kind of looking at the Greek um, and the context. Um, let me step back and 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 ask you this question: How do we, uh, as Christians in our American Western culture, how do we get past the caricature of Christianity that is painted um, of us right now? The caricature. Um, what's that now? Our actions. Our actions. Great. That's a great, great, um, great answer there. Um, absolutely. You know, and, and, and maybe there's a little bit of recognition and confession, right? I, is it our fault? Is it not our fault, right? It, it, it's that, that's not necessarily productive, or, or maybe it is a little bit. If we go backwards and we go, you know what, the, we do have to... Um, you know, consider how we have represented the Lord maybe improperly at times in the past. And that's a, that's a, good, that's a good discussion to have, right? Um, or just the productive, like, from here out kind of question, how do we represent the Lord really well right now, you know, in our neighborhood, in our homes, um, in, our, in the workplace? But we need to face kind of the caricature of Christianity. Uh, is this, uh, we're self-righteous, right? Maybe we're hypocrites, um, you know, we're right-wingers, we're intolerant, we're uh, narrow-minded, we're simple, we're anti-intellectual. These are all little things that you can pick up on, right, in Hollywood or in music or in interviews, right? We can't think for ourselves. We're dumb sheep. We just follow. Um, uh, we've done more harm than good in human history, right? We hear, I hear that one a good bit, or you read that in, in publications. Um, we're judgmental, we're mean-spirited, we're hate-filled. I say all these, those things just for our awareness. Like if we, if, we, if we just 
if we're aware that, one, we're in the minority, right? Th this is, in our, in our communities, we are 5% of the community, evangelical uh, believers following Christ. We are 5%, okay? Uh, that, that's astonishing. And yet, that's, that's where we live, okay? We need to, we need to understand that. Uh, we go in knowing how we are perceived, and then we counteract that with a life and words that change their perception. Okay, if we can if we can do that, then it's productive. Somebody said this week. I, I read, um, not that I'm always on Twitter, but this pastor that was on Twitter said a deeply profound thing that I wanted to repeat. It says the world is unraveling, and as it does the way of Jesus will become more beautiful and more compelling. Let us model humility, integrity, love, and open arms of mercy and grace to those who uh, are looking for hope and meaning amidst the chaos. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? And you know what's ironic is, is that the audience that First Peter was being read to was just like ours. It was less than 10% believing, it was polytheistic, many ways to meaning and hope and love and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and, um, and it was cruel at times. Um, to give you an example, um, you know, probably if you're, you're probably very much an advocate for, um, you know, for adoption and saving babies from being aborted, right, as, as I am. Um, you know, babies were being tossed over the walls. In infanticide, so they were being discarded on the outside of the walls, Rome, uh, Rome, Jerusalem, and and so, how did the believers back then deal with this? Did they pick it? Uh, did they tweet about it? Did they um, try to change policy? No, <laughs> they literally stood outside the wall, and did this. They waited. Or. They did this to find one still alive. That's no exaggeration. Can we posture ourselves? Again, are we ready? Are we positioned at the wall in heart, in deed, in word, in every aspect uh, to bring hope and, 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 and meaning and love to a world that's in chaos? That's my, my hope this morning. Um, so I'm going to have four fill-ins here, all with the always ready. And the first one is always ready to suffer for doing good. Verse 13 says, now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? You know, zeal is good. Passion for the right thing is good. Being a zealot, that's not really good. That's, uh, that's a different picture, being a zealot, maybe being, uh, you know, overly um, committed maybe to the slightly the wrong thing, right, to religiousness or whatever else. The zealots of, of the day of Scripture were uh, misguided, you know, passionate but misguided. You know, I think of uh, Saul, Paul before he was Paul was Saul of Tarsus, right, and what did he do? He was zealous, and he was zealous for God, but he persecuted, right, he was misguided. So it's possible to be zealous but misguided. But here it says, zealous for what is good. And not what is good to Darren or to you or to individuals, but what is good to God. What does he communicate in his word? What does he highlight? What is meaningful and valuable to God? Would we be zealous for that? Zealous, deeply devoted, passionate, enthusiastic, energetic, right? All those things that you guys mentioned early on. It's important that we're that. We're, we're enthusiastic about lots of stuff, but it, it, is it really the most meaningful stuff on the planet, you know, and what you were created for? That's, that's the question. Uh, I get excited about sports. A lot of us do, right? And, and we can be zealous about that. We could be really passionate, you know, about that. Um, is that really the most meaningful thing? Is that the most important thing? No. Uh, hopefully, things of God get us more jazzed than anything else on earth, right? Some, somebody coming to a saving faith and knowledge of Jesus Christ and their life changes, 
man, I hope we're giving a great shout. Yes! I mean, I hope we're really shouting over that kind of stuff, right? If we're like, oh, well, that is fine, and look at that. That is fantastic. Wow. Way to go. No? I mean, we should really be excited about that. That should get, get us running and our motor going. How about just the conversation with uh, the coworker that you've been trying so hard to share Christ with, and maybe it took two years to get there. Maybe it took four years to get there. And all of a sudden, you have that breakthrough conversation, and they're, and they're open to you sharing your testimony. Do you come home, or do you like can't even wait to get in the car and go, yes, yes, and nobody else sees it but you and God? Right, passionate for the right thing, for what is good. You know, complacency is a deadly foe to all spiritual growth. That's what A.W. Tozer says about it, complacency. Us being flat-footed and eh, casual, cavalier about our faith. You know, God waits to be wanted. God waits to be wanted. That's what he wants from you. He wants to be wanted. Yes, needed. Like, we need God, right? We need God. But he wants to be wanted. He wants you to desire him above other things. He wants you to prioritize him above other things. He actually wants to be above all things in your life. Because that honors him. That brings him praise. That pleases him. And when he's pleased, we get a lot of joy and peace and grace and mercy, and it's beautiful. God wants to be wanted. A.W. Tozer, again, in that same quote, says that he waits to be wanted. He says, but it's too bad that with many of us, he waits so long, so very long in vain. May that not be said of of you or me. But zealous, I want to encourage you to be zealous So write that down. Zeal equals devoted to what is good. Zeal, you want to have passion for God things. The next verse there is verse 14. It says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. So suffer for righteousness sake. What does righteousness mean? Anybody... Give me a a definition or what just comes to your mind. Righteousness. The Lord's work. Yeah, I like that. What else? Righteousness. Any other thoughts? I like it. Yes. Yes. Rightness. Righteousness just means rightness. And we're not right in ourselves. We are righteous before a righteous God through Christ, right? So we have standing before God because of what Christ has done on our behalf, not because of what you earn. You cannot earn your standing, right? Um, But rightness before God, when we're right before God, when we're aligned with Christ, then he makes us right in other relationships. So all of a sudden, our relationships in the home become more right, more Christ-like. All of a sudden, our relationships at work become more Christ-like. Uh, healthier, just on the right track. So righteousness, so when when we suffer for the sake of Christ, we are blessed, and then we don't have any fear or trouble. Now, I I know we will still have fear and trouble, Um, but it is amazing how God enters into that suffering with us and grows us through it. And, and that's, that's the message today, that actually we, we can become more Christ-like because of suffering and because of things we go through than we can without it. It's, it's actually like a checkpoint. When you get to a checkpoint, uh, you, you have to do something. I mean, think about like entering the country, right? You have to prove uh, that you're a civilian. You have to prove you know, with documentation, right? There's a checkpoint. Well, suffering is somewhat of a checkpoint of faith. When you come to a certain point in your life or your walk with Christ, you hit a checkpoint, and you actually kind of need that checkpoint. You, ha- you have to get past that, and you don't earn it because it's earned for you, but there's got to be a placement of faith because God is going to shift something in your life, and it's going to be a shifting of faith where you go, oh my gosh, I didn't realize, but because of this thing, 
it is revealed that I'm placing my faith in my own ability to accomplish something right here, right? And he wants to shift that to him. And the only way to do that oftentimes is to break it, to break us. There are 11 people every day martyred for the Christian faith around the world. 11 people. Think about that. As we're in our homes and eating, you know, from our full fridge and pantry and where I can stand here and I can scream the name of Jesus and maybe you might think I'm weird, but I can do that, right? Um, Nobody's going to get up and shoot me for doing that. Eleven people today will die for righteousness. And you know what? They will do it um, gladly. So suffering has this way of uh, a couple things. It has a way of revealing what we hold on to, like where we are gripping, what we are gripping, and it has a way of doing this. (laughs) There's that last pinky. Oh, no. Right? It has a way of releasing our grip on something so that we can grip something else. One hand can only grip one thing at one time, right? And Jesus wants us to grip him at all times, right? And and it's somewhat of a, um, it's somewhat of a, uh, you know, if if you imagine yourself walking into a department store and and you're, you're looking around and you see price tags of things and, and the price tags are all switched around. This is what sin does. And you look at the diamond necklace, and it, it's like 50 cents. And you're like, oh, well, that's not worth much at all. And there you, you look at the king-size Snickers bar, and it's $450. And you're like, oh, I got to have that, right? And, and, and then you go over to the next thing, and, and it's 50000 And you go over to the next thing, and it's three cents. And, and it's like we, we really believe those things. Like we, we really value our ego over Christ's authority and and glory in our lives at times and our ego is like worth three cents it's nothing it's worthless right or promotion at work okay that's great but in the grand scheme of things that's worthless or people respecting me and my blah 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 Uh, okay is that important really it really isn't because when God gets in there he starts shifting things around through suffering and through trials and through failure and all of a sudden, you go, oh my gosh, that is the diamond necklace. That's actually not the fake. Oh, wow, I want that. And you start to value things in the right way. Because reality says, you can't take that thing with you into eternity. Right? The other checkpoint is, you come to the security line at the airport, and have you done this? You looked over and you saw a list, of, uh, just a table full of things that were sitting there. Oops. That were sitting there, and you go, ooh, I've done this, this is not long ago. I looked and I was like, I want that pocket knife so badly. <laughs> have you ever done that? You see something? Oh my gosh, that's a, water, that's a Yeti water bottle. I got to have that thing. How can I? You can't. Because that table right there, things on that table can't go through there. They can't. So what's worthless over there shouldn't be valued over here. Are you with me on that? And God has a way of, bringing to light the value, the true value of things in our lives through suffering. And you, you start to see eternity, and you go, oh, wow, I can't take that with me. So to suffer for doing good, always be ready to suffer for doing good. Always be ready to witness with your words. This is the next point. Verse 15, in your hearts... Honor Christ the Lord as holy. Another way to look at that is set Christ apart as Lord. Set Christ apart as Lord. You remember Matt uh, talking maybe a couple or a few weeks ago uh, in chapter um, 2, verse 9, it says this. You are a chosen race. You remember this? A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You remember that verse? In essence, it's saying you have been set apart by Christ. Therefore, set Christ apart. It's kind of a cool play on words. So in chapter 2, we, we learn that we are his special possession. Wow, we're, we're the apple of his eye. 
That's how scripture indicates you and me. We are near and dear to his heart, a special possession. That should make him special to us. There should be a very special place in your heart for Jesus Christ that nobody else occupies. Not mom, not dad, not grandma, not spouse, not children. Christ above all. He's, he's preeminent. He is first. He's top priority. Special place in his heart. I mean, excuse me, in your heart. So it says, honor Christ. Honor or revere or reverence. So write that down. Honor, reverence, set apart. Write those three things down. Reverence just simply means to, uh, to make him sovereign of our lives. So he's preeminent. He's top. He's number one. Right? And that's not a weird religious thing. Again, you don't have to become a zealot and, and start wearing, you know, putting on the bumper stickers and wearing the t-shirts. And y- you can do that. But that doesn't mean that you're committed to Jesus. Um, you following Christ doesn't mean you have to, the, the t-shirts and the bumper stickers have to follow. Okay, that, that's, not, that's not what's going to win our world over. You know, it's displaying Christ with our words, and we'll come to it next, also with our, our lives, and, and both of those validating one another. That's how we show that Christ is preeminent in our lives. But uh, you may be wondering, like, why, because I said to witness with your words, so why, why does setting Christ apart in my heart have anything to do with my words? Does anybody know that Matthew passage? Matthew 15, 18, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds where? From the heart. Oh, dang. Here we go, right? Some of you just went, oh, here it comes. Give it to me, Darren. Go ahead. (laughs) I'm ready. (laughs) Right? Because that's hard. That is hard to control. The tongue is hard to control. And James says it has great, great power. Something so small as the tongue can, can steer the Titanic or battleships, right? But what it reveals is what the heart is rooted in, and that's why it's so important. Because what your heart is rooted in will bear fruit, and it tends to come out right here. It does. It tends to come out right here. And that can be a dagger or it can be a salve for a wound. It can go either way. And if there's grace in there, when we're cut, we bleed grace. That's the way it works. God wants to get to our hearts because it it affects everything. So it's the gateway, right? So we want to witness with our words. So he goes on to say, always be prepared. Again, that's back to the, you know, the stance. We're in the right, the proper stance. For what? Verse 15, to make a defense. That, that is the, the Greek word apologia, where we get the, the word apologetics from. So it is actually like a written or a prepared statement. So not that you need to, like, when you come into that situation, let's say uh, you have a cousin that you've been trying to share Christ with, and you see them in a reunion. It's not like this, like, oh, yeah? Well, I've been preparing for this conversation, <laughs> Right? Why don't you sit down, because I'm going to unload on you right now. All right? You ain't got nothing on me. I've been prepping. All right? That's not, that's not the picture here. But the picture is like anticipating, right, the things we talked about in, in the beginning, the caricatures. It would behoove you to anticipate those coming from a world that doesn't like the Christian faith. Oh, yeah? Well, you've done more harm than good for, you know, hi- human, uh, human history than any other religion. Okay. Maybe we should be prepared for that. Oh, is that, is that right? Okay, wait, in what kind of way? Well, the Crusades. Okay, good point. And the church has to own that one. Okay, that was not a shining example of what the church was meant to do and be. Right? Be prepared to have that conversation, to go into that with your eyes open. To make a defense to anyone who asks you for what? The hope that is in you, right? There's, we could pick apart literally every word. It's so beautiful. The language here is so beautiful. 
anyone, right? Anyone could ask you at any time for the hope that you have, right? So, but that means they have seen the hope somewhere, right? They're going to ask you about that which they witness, that which they see in your life. So maybe you're talking about it. Maybe you're, and this is what I, I like to think about it as dropping bait, right? And you just think little things, right? You can do little things with your words to, um, to encourage somebody to engage in the conversation, right? Uh, it, it could be something as simple as, well, you know, I, I'm just, you know, happy, you know, God's really blessed me, right? Why would you somebody say that unless they're trying to, right? Unless they're trying to point to something other than themselves. It can be very simple. It can be very simple. Um, doesn't have to be dropping the bomb on somebody, but it has to be intentional, and that's the apologia part of it. Be intentional to point to the hope. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, I think that one of the most powerful statements is just some, somebody simply saying, well, I don't know where I would be without God. That ripples people's, um, w- with challenge, it ripples through somebody's heart. It's almost like, or mine, it's, uh, it, it's almost like a nagging uh, rock in somebody's shoe. That's what that ends up being, because they'll, they'll walk around with it, and then they'll be like, oh, right, that statement that he said. Like, what did he mean by that? Right, he wouldn't, okay, where would he be? I mean, it's not like he's a, you know, a pr- you know like a criminal of any kind. He's not going around killing anybody. Where, where would he be, right? The Holy Spirit has a way of uh, taking those little rocks in people's shoes and, and producing something bigger. So a defense for the hope that is in you. Biblical hope is akin to faith. It's based on God's promises, realized, right? We start to see God involved in the different angles of our life. Verse 15c, it says, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Okay, so it's not just about getting truth in there, right? This is like we should put the hammer away. It's not about the truth hammer and whamming and doing our thing with truth, right? There is a grace sense there, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull something in in a, in a second um, because I, I think we need to think about this one a little bit. You know, the word used with gentleness is pratis, P-R-A-U-T-E-S, humility. So write down humility. Um, humility, it's often translated gentleness or meekness, I don't like the word meekness in our culture because we've associated meekness with what? Oh, you guys were so fast, right? Weakness. Why? Why have we associated those two? And again, it's back to the caricature, right? Is it possible for a believer to be really strong? Strong in character? Yes, strong in opinion, but gentle towards a person? Yes, it is. But see, that blows a category in in an unbelieving world. Because the category for religion is this like dogmatic, believe whatever you want to believe, but like if you have conviction, you're, you're going to spew, you're going to bulldoze, you're going to hammer, right? But when you stand up in strength of conviction and character and communicate it through gentleness and respect, there's no categories for that. This is a category in and of itself to balance that grace and truth that Jesus did so well. It blows categories. Humility, meekness. So the picture here is not, you know, you know Ned Flanders, uh, you know, kind of this weak, like nerdy, whatever. The, the, that, that's the picture the world has of Christianity. No, it's actually of a, a, a Clydesdale horse because that is power under control. Okay, that is meekness. That's humility. There is strength and power. I mean, think about a 17-hand horse that can pull, like, crazy amount of weight, right? But they're saddled, and they, they're bridled, and you can control them. Do they lose strength? No. They're so stink, and they could, they could crush you in a second, right? But they're under control. That is meekness. There's something beautiful about strength, and gentleness going together. And you know why? Why? Because it's Christ. Now we, are, we are so attracted to Christ. When the world gets a real 
image and glimpse of the real Jesus, they cannot stay away. They can't stay away. And that includes Jesus in you. People would not, will not be able to stay away. So write that one down. The horse is the picture. So meekness equals strength control. Strength under control. The third point here is always ready to witness with your life. So I met, mentioned witnessing with your words. Now we're going to mention uh, or address witnessing with your life. Verses 16 and 17. 16 says, having a good conscience. So that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So we don't need to put anybody to shame. We don't need to argue anybody out of whatever or convince anybody into whatever. Right? We share Christ. We share the love of Christ and the truth of Christ. And we're strong enough to let that be enough. We don't have to win the argument. And we validate our words with our life. And we val validate uh, our life with our words. Both. They go hand in hand. And that gives us a good conscience, a clear conscience. We don't value that in America today. Nobody talks about having a good, clean, clear conscience. We don't value it, but we should value it in the church. We should value it in, in, in the church because when you have a good, clean conscience, you know you are right with the Lord and your actions and your words line up and validate one another. You know you're not right, um, excuse me, wrong with anybody in this present phase, maybe you and your spouse uh, um, you know, went through phase of tension and you've worked that out through Christ. Christ is Lord over that and you go praise God, right? Maybe uh, there's a family member, you know, an uncle that you had you know, rub with and all of a sudden you confess something to him and all of a sudden things got right and you feel stronger. You feel like you're standing on you know, two footings. You're not off guard anymore. You feel right. You walk tall. You go, oh my gosh, I, I feel right with the Lord. I feel right with my spouse. I feel right with my neighbors. I feel right with my family members. Um, whoa. It provides a clean, clear conscience. And, and, and you walk taller. You really do. We should value a good conscience. The witness of our life. Write this down. Good conscience equals self-awareness. It is the alarm system of our hearts. It goes off. Now, sometimes we can overshoot and be too hypersensitive. Maybe we're people pleasers and everything's an issue, and right? So we, we need the body of Christ to give us perspective on that, but too often we're the other way. That's the reality. Too often we're not sensitive enough to our sin and how we affect people. But having a good, clean conscience is relying on the body of Christ to speak into that, give us... Um, um, you know, perspective on that thing that we're dealing with or that issue or our tendency, right? And, and they speak into that and bring self-awareness. And so back to the Crusades, you know, that, that, was, that was bad, okay? That was bad. We can say that. That was a bad example of the church attempting to live out their faith. Um, but is, is that, you know, the world would look at that and they, see, they will say, see, look at what happens when you're too into Jesus. And that's actually... The opposite. Look at what happens when you're not into Jesus enough, right? When the gospel doesn't quite take root in, in every corner of your life, that's what comes out. And, you know, there's, there's stories of, you know, soldiers, you know, with the cross on their shields, and they would get baptized before they went into battle, and they would take their sword into the waters of baptism, but when they went under it, they would hold the sword above the water, as if to say, God, you can have everything except this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to baptize everything. I'm going to immerse everything except this. Right? And that, that's when the bad angle of Christianity, the bad representation of Christianity comes out. So is it because we were too into Jesus? No, we were not into Jesus enough. And, you know, we, we hold up our swords all the time. You guys, this is why we have community groups, to call out those swords that we're holding up. Right? We all got them. And I need the body of Christ to say, hey, brother, because I love you, I need to point something out. Man, you got some ego showing over here. Hey, thank you, right? That should be my response. Whoa, thank you very much. Can you help me take that away? Because my grip on that is pretty tight. 
right? And for us, it could be a credit card. For us, it could be a relationship. It could be a sexual ethic. It could be a political party. It could be uh, an entertainment habit. It could be a theological uh, viewpoint that is not biblical, right? We do this all the time. We hold up that sword. But the encouragement here is that, that both in word and in lifestyle, right, that people would see our witness. And if you have something that you're holding up, maybe, maybe the way to get rid of that is to call it out on yourself. Like, hey, brother or sister, hey, can you, can you pray for this? Like, I'm struggling with this one thing. I just want to get it out in the light, right? We all need that. We've got to get it out in the light. So always ready to witness with your life. I want to show you um, just a, a three-word illustration here um, for us to be in balance on the inside, on the outside, what we believe, how we live, right? There's three words I want to bring to your attention, and I'd encourage you to, oh, well, yeah, either take a picture or write these down. Orthodoxy is what we believe. It's correct doctrine. Orthodoxy. Orthodoxy. So that, that means uh, when we are orthodox believers, we are believing the word of God properly. We are um, submitting our lives to the truth of Christ, the gospel, the Bible. Uh, there's way too much buffet Christianity going on in America today. Orthodoxy is, you know what, I'm going to trust the word of God knows what it's talking about. Okay, There is truth. Truth is not relative. Uh, it plugs into my life, and it's timeless, and it can plug into my culture. So just because my culture is going through something or believes something, right, doesn't mean I need to sacrifice the word of God for cultural application. Okay, I can hold on to the word of God dearly, uh, tightly, and, and it will positively affect change in culture. Okay, orthodoxy. But there's also orthopraxy. And that means that, that I'm practicing God's truth properly in my life. And so what people see in, in, dis, in, in display, on display in my life, is the Bible lived out, right? So orthopraxy, the lifestyle is right. But here's an often overlooked one, orthopathy. And that is correct emotions or affections. So, you know, I would say Darren, in my mid-20s, uh, was, um, was learning a lot about my Christian faith and my walk and apologetics, and oftentimes could sacrifice the person for being right. I wanted to be right, and I had good arguments, and I could argue people down, right? Um, the spirit with which I argue and defend the faith is just as important as the truth that I'm communicating. And so there needs to be a sense of grace. Darren is never justified to get upset with somebody and, and raise my voice and get super passionate about this thing that I'm arguing, right? Uh, because it's, there, it's possible to have the right spirit, not just the right doctrine, not just the right living, but also the right delivery. Again, and that's, this goes back with gentleness and respect. See, we don't have to... We don't, we don't need the world to say, oh, Darren is right. Wow, what a great argument. No, that's, that's not the point. That's not the point. We want God to get the glory. Well, what we want the world to say is, wow, we see that truth living out in your life. right? Or maybe they will, five years down the road, they'll see it unpack in their life. And they'll come back to you and go, hey, can you speak into me? I'm really going through a tough time. right? So orthodoxy, orthopraxy, orthopathy. And the last thing, always ready to glory in Christ's suffering. You know, there's a really hard section of Scripture, verses 19 and 20 and 21, that I wish I could get into. It actually would take me a, a little bit of time, and, and it's probably one of the hardest passages of Scripture in all of Scripture to interpret. So little old me ain't going to solve it in three minutes or less, okay? So I, I would encourage you to read it up, uh, read up on it. Um, even Spurgeon said uh, he couldn't figure this one out. So if that lets you know, um, there, are, there are three major interpretations there, but I'd encourage you to look that up. I, I didn't want to take time um, hitting that because of, the, because of verse 18. Look at 18. For Christ also suffered once 
for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Now he's gone to heaven and he sits at the right hand of God with power, angels, and authorities. Beautiful. So Christ. So this is how we get past that suffering situation or that hard situation. We think about Christ. We think about what Christ endured for us, the beauty of the gospel. We remind ourselves of the gospel every day. Jesus suffered more and for a greater purpose. The thing that you're suffering is real and it's hard, but there's a bigger picture. God will bless you through that. He'll make you more like him. God will bless other people through that. People will see that you suffer with grace and you keep your eyes on Christ. But just think about Christ as our example. Think about those, those four or five things. He suffered. He took our punishment of sin on himself. He suffered unjustly for me. The righteous for the unrighteous. Somebody called that once the great exchange. My tainted record. I mean, if you pulled out a record of all the things Darren has thought wrong, done wrong, attempted wrong, right? I mean, it would be a filing drawer way, way too big. Way too big. And what did, what did Jesus do wrong? Not one thing. So he quite literally goes to my file cabinet, picks that up, puts that on his back, and walks up to the cross and pins himself to the cross. The great exchange. And while he's holding my filing cabinet of sin and disregard and shame, he takes out his perfect record and he says, this is for you. This is for you. The great exchange, the righteous for the unrighteous. That he might bring us to him being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. You know, he rose from the dead, you guys. That's the great separator of the Christian faith. You take that away, we got nothing. But if that is true, don't you think he knows a little something about life? Oh yeah, he does. He is our pioneer. He went before us. But he's our perfecter and he comes behind us. And he's our brother and he stands beside us. He does it all. He does everything. Freedom, completeness, reconciliation, all that is in Christ. I want to read two more verses because I think this is so powerful. This thought of Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. Look, look at this. Every priest, Hebrews 10, Every priest stands day to day, day after day, ministering and offering the sacrifices time after time, which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Why was he finally able to sit down? It is finished. So tell me this. Why is he standing in Acts 7? Verses 55 through 58. Look at Stephen. Stephen gave his life. Stephen was stoned. Stephen gave everything away. And yet look at this verse. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing in the right hand of God. Why wasn't he sitting? It's finished, right? Why was Jesus all of a sudden standing? Oh my goodness. I mean, could it be possible that the one who created us, when we go through hard things for his sake and we keep our eyes on him, that he, that he might possibly rise up and go, yes, my man, I'm so proud of you. You did it, man. You did it, girl. Yes. Yes, that's my boy. That's my girl. You kept your eyes on me. I might be reading way too into that, but I think it's very possible. I do. Not because it's about us, but because God sees. He's the God who sees. He knows every effort 
you have made for the faith. He knows everything you have attempted and maybe failed at. He knows it all. God is so good. Romans 8, 17. If children, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. Look at this. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is revealed to us. Praise God. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you so much. God, would you give us perspective on all the hard things we deal with? God, we want to see you in the midst of it. We want to be made new because of it. And we want to be just like you, Jesus, but we can't do that on our own. God, would you be our everything? And Lord, thank you for this body of Christ that we can learn and grow alongside of. Um, Continue to bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross is spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever jesus christ my living home hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip Praise the one who 
So I just wanted to encourage you guys with your giving, um, if the ushers wanted to come forward. Um, so I just wanted to say, uh, you know, as Christians, we're called to live open-handed. You know, we're not pursuing blessing, we're not pursuing wealth, and we're not even pursuing heaven, but we're pursuing a person. And what that looks like is we love because he loved. We forgive because we've been forgiven. And we give because he gave everything. 